Hi, Lindy. Hello, Shelly. This is, um, for everyone who's watching, this is Lindy of Lindy's Magpie Reads, and she has a wonderful channel <laughs> on YouTube, and you read so many books, and our tastes overlap. I don't know that many people, readers, who also share picture books, but you're so good about continuing to share all, all of your reads, including the picture books, so I, I find that very inspiring. If we have time today, I've got some picture books to tell you about, too. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I don't know what you've chosen for your superlative, and I'm curious to know what you're going to share. So what are you, what are you okay, going to share with so us? this is a, my surprise, I guess. Um, you had talked about the superlatives being, you know, something that really struck uh, uh, me in 2022, and I ended up narrowing it down so much that it was what really struck me in January of 2023. So. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> because I read 30 or 40 books every month. And so it's easier for me to, you know, look at a smaller subset. And this book I'm going to tell you about, I am going to think about it for a really long time. It is no Friend But the Mountains by Behrouz Bouchani. So he's a Kurdish Iranian who uh, was in, in danger in Iran because of his political involvement with the Kurdish resistance. And so he made his way to Australia to seek asylum. But once he got there, he was imprisoned with hundreds of other asylum seekers. And so that was in 2013 that that happened. And he was a journalist, he was uh, an intellectual. And he, even though they were forbidden to have paper and pen even, and um, mobile phones or anything like that, with a smuggled phone that he hid in his mattress, he uh, smuggled out text messages this entire book wow. that was translated by Omid Tofigian, an Australian Iranian. And and the book is amazing. It's it's harrowing, but it is also really inspiring and as I said, thought provoking. It has uh, a foreword written by Richard Flanagan, the Australian author. Mm. Uh, and, and then the translator has quite a long section at the beginning and at the end, um, looking at uh, Buchani's writings in a sort of scholarly and political way, mm. I think a lot of context. Mm -hmm. And then the main middle part, of course, is... Buchani's memoir, but it's not only memoir, it's also um, journalism and it's poetry. It's realism, but also surrealism, depending on what part you're at. And the mm -hmm. translator even calls it a combination of horror and surrealism, horrific surrealism. Mm -hmm. So one of the surprising things about this is that I started reading it sometime last year in the print format and I gave up on it. Hmm. I got as far as uh, Buchani being in a boat that was um, taking in water and it looked like they were all going to drown um, on this desperate voyage to Australia. And uh, I wasn't emotionally prepared. You know, I, I mean, I've I've read a lot of refugee stories mm -hmm. and I could see how well this was written, but I just thought, no, I don't think I can read this right now. And it's a big fat book too. Oh, is it? Well, then in January, I saw that um, my library had an audio copy available. And so that's what I did. I listened to it. I was 
mesmerized, enchanted. Um, the audio production is really excellent. They've actually got 10 different narrators. Wow. Including Richard Flanagan and um, Tofigian, the translator, and then eight other people doing different sections of the audiobook. Um, so it's it's way more than a refugee narrative because he's talking about the whole Australian border industrial complex. You know that it's something like the prison industry in the US where mm -hmm. it's self-sustaining and the colonialist and xenophobic attitudes that underlie it hmm. are examined in this. Um, he really looks at the ways that uh, torture is used systemically. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. there's the, mm -hmm. there's the filth, there's the, uh, the overcrowding, um, the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the facility is just horrendous. They don't have enough food. Um, but also, it's like the most important thing is what that system does to the psyche of mm -hmm. these people who are being held there and how they're kind of destroyed from the inside. Uh, you know, the despair and the hopelessness and how that comes about. Um, mm. For example, uh, the Australian prison guards don't allow them to play any games. You know, if they, you know, come up with scratching up some sort of game board and using the taps from their water bottles, no, it's broken up, not allowed. Huh. Um, having to line up for their meals in the hot sun. And this is on Manus Island in Papua New Guinea. So it's it's very hot and humid all the time. There's so many mosquitoes. And as I said, really crowded. Uh, and there are you know, 400 people lined up for a meal and allowed to go in only five at a time. Mm. And uh, the last 50 people might have no food left at all by the time they get there. Wow. And, and so, you know, this encourages people to fight with each other to try and get to the front of the line. The guards are there watching, you know, it's all that kind of demoralizing and dehumanizing. Mm -hmm. Yes, the right from the start, the asylum seekers have to give up their clothing and then they're issued clothing that doesn't fit whatever size they are. Um, but before that, they're strip searched. You know, all of those kind of dehumanizing elements and, and what it does to people expressed in prose that it's just so well put together. So that's the thing. And I'm, it, it won tons of awards. <laughs> I, I wrote them down. So it came out in 2018. Okay. So at that time, he was still imprisoned. Wow. Um, good news is he has since been freed. Um, Amnesty International and the UN Refugee Agency, I think it is, like together, like they worked hard to get oh, that's him good and news. many others freed. Mm -hmm. um, and currently Buchani is um, settled in New Zealand. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so in 2018, when it came out, he won the Victorian Prize for Literature, the Victorian Premier's Prize for Nonfiction, and then in 2019, the New South Wales Premier's Award, they gave him a special award. And the Australian book industry called it the General Nonfiction Book of the Year. Wow. And then in 2020, uh, the audio edition was awarded as Audiobook of the Year. Hmm. Yeah. So I'm not the only one who thinks it's fantastic. <laughs> I feel like I'm a bit late coming to it, but right. I think. This book is going to remain important for a really long time. 
So how did he, did he write the book? How, how did he, how did he get the manuscript together? Unless that's a, a spoiler. He, is it just through text messages? On WhatsApp. What? Long, long text messages. Then he wasn't able, like whenever he had access to actually send a message and then keeping his phone hidden too. Um, I think three times his phone was taken away by guards and he had to have another one smuggled in. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And, and then, well, I was going to say, and, and then ha yeah, it has to be organized enough that somebody would put this together so it reads as a narrative, which is just phenomenal to think about. Meanwhile, yes. he's still experiencing what he is experiencing. That's yeah. incredible. Yeah. Huh. Wow. Yeah. And so, you know, that aspect of the book was kind of a hook for me thinking, oh, you know, that is so unusual, the way it was written. Mm -hmm. um, but that really became a, a secondary thing. Once I was reading it, it was just, it's just so good. <laughs> really? Yeah. Wow. Well, I'm definitely interested. I'm like, I need to look at this book and see if my library has it and see if it's available on audio, because that sounds really, really good. Yeah. And really important too, because I don't think we really talk about I think certain countries' judicial systems and prison systems get highlighted more than others. And so, you know, in refugee stories, you hear certain ones over and over, but you don't hear, you don't hear the scope of it. And so it's interesting that this is highlighted. It's highlighting a different part of the, you know, the world that I don't, that I personally don't know um, yeah, as well, well as I should. And Australia is not the only country, as you mm. know, right. that is illegally detaining asylum seekers. You know, according to international law, it is not illegal to seek asylum. Right. And um, and for these people who are seeking asylum to be detained indefinitely. Now, that's the thing. You know, it's reasonable to... We just need to check out this individual's claims. But uh, in this case, what um, Buchani is writing about is they're, they're given numbers. They're not treated as individuals. And they're not um, given any date that this is, you know, we'll, we'll let you go after this period of time. The only thing they keep being told is if you want to get out, you have to go back to your home country. Oh. Yeah, that's, that's ridiculous. That's so because they're, they're seeking asylum for a reason. So you can't, you can't yeah. go back, you don't have the option. Wow. That's fascinating. So, so the title actually comes from a Kurdish proverb. And I realized it, um, it captures that necessity to be self reliant. Mm. for a people who have um, historically experienced injustice. Actually, that's another thing that was a surprise to me about this book. I had never heard anyone say that Kurdish people were indigenous. And that's how the translator refers to the Kurdish people as indigenous people. Oh. You know, I, I when I think of indigenous peoples, I think of North and South America, mm -hmm. and Australia, New Zealand. And I know there's lots of Indigenous peoples in Asia as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but it just hadn't occurred to me that the Kurdish people mm. fit that category. I thought of them more as um, an ethnic minority, you know? Oh, yeah. I hadn't and thought I about that. I suppose the distinction doesn't really matter. Um, if people are oppressed, that's the main thing, right? True. Yeah. Well, what a, I didn't know that when I said um, a book that struck you, <laughs> that you would come up with one that just sounds so both harrowing and important and like one that would give me um, quite, quite the learning curve, you know, because I just, these are like topics that I feel like I explore, but not, not as much as maybe 
don't want to say that I should, but not as not as regularly as I would like, I suppose. So yeah, wow, what a what a powerful book. Um there are there are a bunch of other prison narratives that I can think of, you know, that have over the years really made an impression on me. Mm -hmm. The writings of Alexander Solzhenitsyn and um, Nelson Mandela. Um, and more recently, Tracy Chi has a novel from the viewpoint of a group of Japanese American teens who were um, put in a prison internment camp during the Second World War. That mm -hmm. It's called We Are Not Free. It's really good. Mm -hmm. And um, Canadian author Karen Connolly wrote The Lizard Cage, which is about a political prisoner in Burma who mm. was sentenced to solitary confinement for 20 years. Um, there's another one about Australian, the Australian border. It's an Afghani family. Uh, what is it called? On Fragile Waves. Lily oh, what a great Yu, title. What I a think. great title. Yeah, Lily Yu is the author. And a portion of that story includes the family being imprisoned mm. um, before they're allowed to stay in Australia on a on a temporary visa so it's like they're constantly under threat of deportation mm -hmm. so yeah that was another really good book um and then when i talked about no friend but the mountains on my channel uh there was uh another booktuber who recommended the shadows it's a graphic novel by zabus and hippolyt Hmm. Not so it was um, Dia from Novel Ideas. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm so glad she recommended it because it's also really good. It um, it starts and ends with the immigration detention center. And then in the middle, it's how this young person ended up, you know, wow. there. Yeah. But it's, you know, the very similar themes about... Um, the dehumanization and um, you're only going to get out here, out of here, if you go back to your home country. That, that thought that, which is, Oof, yeah. 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 I, as you were talking, I was thinking about the booktube prize. I think it got silver, but it was Daniel James Brown facing the mountain, which talks in a portion of it um, about, Japanese families, Japanese American families who were put into internment camps, um, but also Hawaiian American, Hawaiian American who were um, originally Japanese and, um, and also um, first generation or maybe second generation Japanese born young men who end up forming a troop in the U.S. Army and having to overcome their um, disagreements and kind of form how to unite to form a unit that ends up fighting in World War II. So it's kind of a, a split narrative among a lot of things, but it does cover partly the Japanese American or the Japanese, yeah, uh, internment camp experience that happened that I feel like is not talked about very often um, in, in our history, at least. Right, right. Uh, and there are there are a lot of stories that touch on this um, in England as well. Mm -hmm. um, the first one that comes to mind is Ali Smith's Spring. Oh. So it's part of her seasonal quartet. Mm -hmm. And one of her characters in there is a corrections officer in the immigration uh, prison. I yeah. just finished Winter recently, her first, the first one in the seasonal quartet. <laughs> She's got such dry humor. <laughs> like, I mean, it's like, but it's great. It's just like she's doing the quip 
And I was like, I think if people didn't get it, they wouldn't think it was funny. But I was laughing so hard. It's like they're at the um, Department of Motor Vehicles. But um, I'm not sure what they call it, if they call it the same thing um, in England. And it's, you know, trying to get the picture right. And um, anyways, it's such like, it's such a flat delivery. <laughs> but it's so good. <laughs> because you're just cracking up because she's just got this um it's smart humor anyways I really enjoyed it she's lyrical um, yeah yeah she really addresses moral questions and social justice and uh, contemporary political issues but with such warmth and generosity and humor mm -hmm. just I, I love her writing. Yeah. Yeah, I know. And then I know that her most recent book, you and Roz from Scala Dandelina about the books really enjoyed it. And so I was like, I would love to pick that one up. So yeah, um, companion piece. Companion. There you go. Yeah, that was one of my favorite books last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I know that you mentioned picture books. Do you have oh, some yeah. picture books to yeah, show? Yeah. All right. Okay. So. <gasps> Uh, yeah, so um, Letters to a Prisoner. This one is entirely wordless, and you know exactly, it's for all ages, you know exactly what's going on. There's a protest. Right. The right. red circles, the blue squares, and the battles and being taken away to prison. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Not allowed. Uh, not allowed to have letters. His imagination is supporting him, but all the, these letters get burnt. And more and more letters eventually make a difference. There's the SOS. Wow. People from around the world contribute to getting him released. Wow. So, you know, an Amnesty International kind of story. <laughs> yes. Yes. You know, so as... As we're on this topic, I will, I just remembered that, I don't know if you listen to This American Life. Um, no, no. No, well, it's a podcast. It's been around since the 80s, I think. I know One of hour, it. You know of it. Okay, okay. Um, by the creator is Ira Glass. And he, the pot, you're going to have to, it would have to Google it. Um, but the podcast won a Pulitzer Prize. It's never, it's never won. No audio production has won a Pulitzer Prize because the Pulitzer likes to keep things for written form, but they finally gave in 2020 This American Life an audio, a special award for their audio production. And it is all about the amnesty speakers that are being stopped at the Mexican American border. A lot of times in Texas, um, that's, that's the main places or even in California, sort of right there. And it was during the Trump presidency and it is all about the experience of living living in these unsafe, unhygienic conditions, in which the um, it, I mean, tr truly, truly horrendous. But there's all this reporting about you know what to do when you're in this experience, and you can't go back. You can't go back to your country to, um, but you're stuck trying to cross. Um, and 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 they're, the borders aren't open. And what and and I think that for me, it made that issue very real. Like it made me understand the actual experience of truly having to live in sort of makeshift camps, and maybe you have children, and do you send the children over because the, you know the u s. might take children versus yourself, and do you separate yourself? and And the experience of and the terror in some ways it was a really fascinating and incredibly well done piece and it's an hour long it's totally worth the listen in my opinion I made, an, I made a note of it I will definitely track that yeah. down yeah okay uh, 
So the other right. picky books I've got are both okay. uh, Swiss author Armin Greeter. Mm -hmm. uh, and are you familiar with The Island? Mm -mm. Oh, the other one is The Mediterranean. And The Mediterranean oh. is mostly, um, almost entirely wordless as well. Very, very dark. And it starts out with um, a drowned body. Mm. Wow. Feeding the fishes. Wow. And then you see the fish being caught and sold at market and being eaten. <laughs> and we're still following the food chain. Wow. Uh, you know, the sale of arms and Well, again, you know, what's going on maybe in post-colonial countries that have then switched to dictatorship, it's war, places destroyed, um, refugees. Well, you see them on a truck. Mm. And... There they are on, they're oh. on a boat. Oh, it's going to be full circle. Probably. That's my guess. Ah, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so these really dark, and then there's an explanation at the, at mm. the end, but, you know, really the story is contained in those images that go around back to the beginning. This one again has that same you know dark charcoal kind of ominous illustrations um this one starts out with a raft arriving i don't know if you can see mm. that and person who arrives is looking pretty vulnerable mm -hmm. and this is what the islanders look like they mm. want to send them back onto his raft mm -hmm. out to the ocean. But the fisherman says, uh, you know, let's let's welcome him. This is the welcome he gets. He gets put into a, a goat pen locked up there. And, yeah. And so, that, yeah, that's the, the start of the story. Mm. Again, of xenophobia and fear, just such fear and cruelty these both of these armin greeter picture books are for older students mm, so it's, of course know, grade six and older yeah and all the way up to adults yeah i really like picture books that um that are engaging for adults yeah, yeah. Yeah. And last year, when you and Jack of Spread Book Joy did the uh, picture book readathon, uh, what was it called? Picture This mm -hmm. in, in April. Mm -hmm. Oh, I just loved it. Oh, oh that was that's great. <laughs> I'm so glad. I'm so glad. I'm like, I know this is not on the exact same lines, but I was just thinking about Sean Tan's The Arrival which I haven't read in a few years. And I really need to go back to it because it doesn't, it talks about the immigration experience, I believe, or it shows, yes. but I don't know, I can't remember how it plays out. So I need to revisit it. Um, but while I'm at the library, I'm going to look up these picture books because I think they're, it, I mean, they're fascinating and it's important to, to see. Yeah, I don't even know if I said that um, Jack Goldstein, is the author of Letters ah. to Yeah, Jack Goldstein, yeah. he's a Canadian, a Quebecois, actually. This was originally published in French, but wow. because it doesn't have text, it doesn't, it's basically the title was French. <laughs> right, right, that's true. Yeah, and then, oh, and then I'm a little bit off topic, but you recently spoke about, um, on the other side, the artist who did that, you read another book by, with 
the, um, oh, the picture um, book with on the, the money. other side of the forest on the other side of the forest yeah, Gerard Dubois right and I looked him up and I was like my library is not on top of it with buying his work so I was like I'm going to have to wish list his items because mm. um but I I really enjoyed his work as well but another I think French Canadian right author uh yeah yeah he's French and now lives in Canada that's right ah okay okay so yeah. I was like, more, more good things coming out of Canada. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, picture books. You know, recently you had um, talked about whether or not you should count picture books as a book that you had read. And some years ago, I went through the same thing. I mean, I keep track of the numbers of books that I read for my own purposes. Um, but even so, I always kind of counted picture books separate. And uh, until I came to the point where I thought, how different is this? Especially because with a picture book, I will often read it at least three times mm -hmm. when I have it out from the library. Mm -hmm. uh, and I spend a lot of time with each double page spread, studying how the words and the art work together or the art alone, if it's wordless, and and what that visual narrative is saying, and um, the the compressed use of language is also really interesting to me about picture books. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm now that I am counting them. I'm so glad that I am, because like you, I spend time reading them more than once often and thinking about them and deciding what stands out like what stands out and why it stands out and questioning the choices um, if, if something's not working or even if something is working tremendously well but I noticed the moment I started actually counting it among all of my other reads I'm highly motivated <laughs> just that little that little thing of checking it off as a book read is really motivating. Whereas before it would almost, there would almost be like a, a tiny bit of holding myself back. Um, and I don't well, know why that is. I think it, it's recognizing that this is important literature, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that it's worth considering. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I'm excited to, talk about more picture books um with with you know on on youtube um but also just it has really enriched my reading and i just started doing it this month and so i'm really just like enjoying the process of it so yeah hey. yeah well i am gonna um i noticed that we only have a few minutes left so i'm going to stop the recording okay <laughs> and i'm gonna say bye to at least bye everybody for, bye